Okay, we are moving into chapter three this week. Um, this is going to be all about the difference between natural and manufactured fibers. Um, last week we did the basic characteristics of different types of fibers. And then this week we're going to go into way more detail about each individual fiber themselves. So properties and characteristics of textile fibers, they form the foundation for apparel, home, or industrial applications. Now remember, we break down the textile industry into apparel, home, and then industrial um, textiles. So um, that's something to remember for the exam that's coming up. Uh, the exams then include chapters 1, 2, and 3. So lots of intro information, very basic information, but this again is going to compile um, and you're going to need to remember all that for the final exam and the further um, you know, as you continue in the course. Fibers are the major building blocks of any material. So again, fibers are the tiniest component that make up a yarn and then make up fabric and then make up a shirt. Um, or, you know, you can skip that yarn stage. A fiber is the basic component that makes up um, a diaper. Fiber is the main component that makes up something like um, the uh, upholstery in your vehicle, inside of your car. So really fibers are the tiny, tiny, tiny little hair-like um, structures that we use to create textiles. Uh, the fiber is only viable when it possesses appropriate chemical and physical attributes for a specific end use. We went over this a little bit already. Um, a great example here is that if you have a fiber um, and you're thinking of making it for use as an umbrella or a raincoat, if that fiber is naturally really absorbent and loves water, probably not a good idea because then your raincoat and your umbrella are going to get soaked and sopping wet and then they're going to be useless. So you really got to think about those chemical and physical attributes and see, do they work for that end use? Um, you must be able to produce it in quantities and prices consistent with market demand. Um, you know, there are so many new technologies. So last, you know, when you turned in your um, assignment last week on the um, recent textile articles, some of those had some really good um, technologies that are being used in the textile industry. Um, things like spider silk, um, you know, using things like bamboo or banana leaf and all these different um, new age technologies to create more sustainable textiles. Um, you just have to think um, it has to be sustainable. It has to be um, able to be produced in quantities that, again, work with market demand. Um, so, you know, as technologies are introduced, um, they need to be adjusted so that they can um, be used to be mass produced. And that's something that with new technologies, um, when they first start out, they don't necessarily meet that requirement, but eventually with modification they can. Okay, so we are going to break up textile fibers even more. We talked a little bit last week about natural fibers versus manufactured fibers. We're actually going to break it down into three categories. So three textile categories, natural, manufactured cellulosic, and then manufactured non-cellulosic. Um, a little bit deeper if we think about that, I'll talk about it in just a second. Um, natural fibers, again, they consist of things like cotton, wool, silk, flax, um, bamboo, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later, actually is somewhat manufactured, um, but um, banana leaf, uh, ramy, jute, these are all natural fibers that come from things in nature. Um, cotton, wool, silk, and flax are the most commonly used natural fibers um, in apparel and home and textiles. So both in interiors and in apparel. Very common. Now cotton, it's the most important of the natural fibers. Um, it's the most well-known. Um, cotton affects social, economic, and environmental conditions around the world. Um, it plays a major role in the development of countries. Um, cotton, the cotton industry was huge in the United States as we were developing. Um, not so much anymore. We still do produce quite a bit of cotton in the South. Um, we grow cotton um, and we manufacture it to a certain extent because of the cotton gins and the you know facilities that do card and comb and clean the cotton. But the leading producers in cotton nowadays are places like India and Turkey, Pakistan, Uzbekistan. China and the U.S. again are still leading producers of the actual fiber itself. But most of the uh, manufacturing or the you know, the production process happens in different countries. Um, 
but again, very, very, very important. An industry uh, that's a billion dollar industry. So many things are made out of cotton, so it's very important when we talk about social, economic, and environmental conditions. Um, cotton is a seed fiber, so again, it's natural. It comes from nature. It's a seed fiber, meaning that it's attached to the seed of the plant, um, and it's called a cotton bowl. Not a cotton ball, but a bowl. Um, nowadays, these are actually used oftentimes in decoration. So it used to be hard. You, you didn't, had probably never seen a cotton bowl, you know, maybe five, ten years ago. Um, but now they're used in uh, decorative applications. So you might have a, you know, a little, um, you know, sprig of cotton in your home. Um, it's dried, so, you know, it doesn't rot or, you know, it doesn't change the way that it looks. So they're dried cotton bowls. Um, typically when you have them interiors for, you know, decoration. Um, but, you know, very, very um, similar to the way that a cotton ball looks. Um, a cotton ball is not just a bowl pulled off of the plant, but it looks very similar. Um, there are two main species that we grow in the United States. We grow um, American Upland and then American Pima. So you might have heard of Upland and Pima before. Um, they're high quality. Um, they're more expensive. They're much softer. You will see them oftentimes labeled on things like sheets or towels, like, ooh, Pima cotton. Um, and they're better quality because they're very long. So we'll talk about, you know, that we talked a little bit about staple length and filament length fibers. Um, but having a longer length staple fiber, so cotton is always going to be measured as a staple length fiber. Um, it's never going to be a mile long. Remember when we're talking about um, those filament fibers, they can be miles long. That's impossible for um, a cotton bowl to ever grow to that size. So no matter how long it is, it's always going to be measured within inches, but it's very long. So Pima cotton has a really long staple length, and so that's what makes it so luxurious. The longer length means that the characteristics of it are uh, much uh, more appealing um, when it comes to aesthetics um, and functionality. Um, other high quality, long staple cottons include Sealand or what we call West Indie cotton. Um, and then of course, most people know the, you know, Egyptian cotton, which again is a very long staple length, a couple of inches, um, sometimes up to three inches long, each individual fiber. Again, very, very long for a staple fiber, um, which makes it so soft and cozy and strong, um, great for linens and um, bed sheets and um, towels and all those types of things that need to hold up. Um, we, caught, we classify cotton based off of the species, the fiber length, the color, and the cleanliness, meaning that we are going to separate, okay, so now we have we have Egyptian cotton, let's say. Um, we also break it down to, you know, the, the length of that cotton. So, oh, this is these are the half inches. These are the pretty short ones. Oh, but these are the three inches. So we like to separate them and classify them based off of their length. Color, colors, there's natural color, there's natural colored cottons, which would be something like a taupey or a beige or a brown even, um, versus white cotton. Um, and then we bleach cotton most of the time too, to make it even more white and perfect. Um, and then the cleanliness, sometimes, you know, you're going to get um, a field where it's going to be, you know, really dirty and your cotton bowls are going to be full of twigs and branches and dirt and debris and then oftentimes we'll have a field where they're very clean so it just depends and so we are gonna we're gonna separate the cotton based off of all of these um, different categories um, and then you can you can rate them on those you know the longer the length the better the cleaner the whiter the color the better the cleaner the actual cotton bowl itself um, less debris within it the better and then depending on the species it's also better so again different ways of classifying cotton um, a longer staple length is the best, um, holds the best fiber properties, so it means it's stronger, more lustrous, a softer, silkier hand. Um, it just feels better overall. Um, cotton is composed mainly of cellulose. Cellulose is, again, the, the chemical composition of that fiber. Um, it's essentially a plant uh, pulp. Um, and it's just essentially um, what the plant is made out of, what cotton is made out of. Um, natural fibers that are cellulosic um, are essentially just made out of plant matter. Um, that's essentially what cotton is. A little bit of water in there, but that's mainly it, is it's made, made up of cellulose. Um, naturally comes in cream or a tan color, but it, again, it can come in quite white if you look at that, you know, that previous slide. Um, it can be very white in color. We, again, will typically bleach cotton um, to make sure that it's pure white. 
um, lengths are about half an inch to two and a half inches. So if you're getting a three inch or three and a half inch length, that's a really nice, nice long staple length. The way that cotton looks, so if you're looking at the longitudinal configuration of it, so the length of it, as if you were looking at, let's say, a straw, the long, you know, the length of that straw, or like a Twizzler, looking at the length of the Twizzler, um, it's typically a flat, twisted tube. So again, this is if you're looking through a microscope, you know, photo micro. Um, micrograph of cotton fibers here. So this is again looking at it underneath the microscope and the length of it is a tube but it's kind of a smushed flat tube and the tube is slightly twisted so there is some twist to it. And again this we'll talk about a little bit later. This you know adds to the characteristics of cotton how it works naturally. So some of the properties, the favorable properties of cotton, it is very strong. It's abrasion resistant, so it holds up well to wear and tear. When we talk about abrasion resistance, remember we're talking about areas where um, rubbing occurs. So if you think about maybe a pair of yoga pants that you have um, in between the thighs where your legs rub back and forth all the time, if it's made out of cotton, it'll hold up pretty good, um, holds up well to you know wear and tear. This is oftentimes why jeans are made out of cotton because they're abrasion resistant, or abrasion resistant I'm sorry, and strong. Jeans need to be strong. It's also hydrophilic. Remember, hydrophilic means it loves water. It likes water. Again, we talked about this before, but it's a plant. Plants need water to survive. Um, cotton absorbs and dries really quickly. That's one of the greatest characteristics of cotton that we love. Um, really great for, again, things like workout wear, towels, robes, things where you want to get that water off of you and you want it to dry up quickly. Um, because of this characteristic, because of this property, it has a cooling effect which makes it comfortable in warm weather. Lots of summer clothing is going to be made out of cotton, 100% cotton. Um, another thing that's great about cotton is it is stronger when it's wet, which makes it really launderable. So when uh, fibers are not stronger when wet, when fibers become weaker when wet, that's usually when you'll see on the tag, hand wash only or dry clean only. Um, not just because maybe you're thinking, oh, it's going to lose its color or, you know, yeah, I don't know, you know, there's plenty of different reasons why you might think it would want to be hand washed or dry cleaned only. But a lot of times it's because if you were to put it in the laundry and if you were to, you know, run it around, whether you have an agitator or not in your washing machine, you're going to break down that shirt, you're going to break down that curtain, you're going to break down that towel if it's made out of a fiber that is weaker when wet. Cotton is great. It's a wash and wear um, fiber. Holds up really well, um, you know, when wet. So it's actually stronger when it's wet. Um, no, no issues with static or pilling. And again, this has to do with static electricity. Um, pills are when the fiber breaks down and sticks to the surface of the fabric um, because of the static electricity. Um, because cotton is hydrophilic, meaning it likes to absorb water, there will be water within the fiber naturally. Um, whether that be environmental moisture or whether it's a little bit wet or whatever that may be. And so that allows it to have no static and thus no pilling. So a great, great thing about cotton. You might be thinking, wait, I have a pair of leggings that they get little pills in between the legs or maybe they get pills behind the knees a little bit. You might want to go look at that tag and see, oh, you know what, this cotton is mis mixed with spandex or it's a cotton poly blend and it's not 100% cotton. Again, cotton doesn't have issues with pills. Um, if anything, it'll have a hole before it creates a pill. Um, cotton is inexpensive. Um, it's pretty easy to grow. Uh, it's pretty easy to manufacture. We have the beautiful cotton gin. If you go through the videos in the video section of the module, you will find some awesome videos. They're kind of old and dated, but they're really great to kind of see how we process cotton. It's an age-old uh, method. We really haven't changed it since the cotton gin was created, um, and it works. But it's inexpensive, easy to do. You don't need a lot of skilled labor in order to produce cotton. Um, but one very big issue with it is the amount of water that it uses. So some unfavorable properties. Um, no luster, very little luster I should say. Um, you can blend it, you can mix it, you can do certain things to cotton to give it some luster. And we talk about luster, we're talking about shine. Um, but not naturally built into it. And again, if you think back to that longitudinal configuration, um, that, that length shape and how cotton looks. Um, it's a tube, but it's a smashed tube, so it's not going to pick up a lot of light, and it's a twisted tube. So again, another reason why it's not going to reflect a lot of light. If it was a circular tube with no dents and no twist to it, it would pick up a ton. 
but again, because of its natural shape of it being a smashed flat and twisted tube, it's not going to pick up very much uh, reflections. So poor luster, poor elasticity, meaning you can't really stretch it and it doesn't bounce back. Remember, think of your rubber band. Think about your hair tie. Those are made out of um, things that have a good elasticity. They stretch out and they can bounce back to their original shape. Something like elastic, um, you know, lycra, those will stretch out. Um, but cotton does not have that uh, property. Um, it doesn't have great resiliency, meaning that if you crumple up cotton, it's not going to bounce back to its original shape. Think about if you take a t-shirt and you crumple it up, and you put it in your luggage and then you pull it out, it's going to keep that crinkly, kind of wrinkly shape to it. But with a little bit of wear and a little bit of hanging, um, especially if it's made out of knit, and if you take an iron or a steamer to it, it will release the wrinkles fairly quickly. Um, but again, it's going to it's gonna hold those wrinkles in it um, until you do something to it. Um, a big problem with cotton is that can it, it can be attacked by mildew and silverfish. So if you leave, you know, everyone has done it once, before, if you leave a towel wet, bunched up on the ground, and you come back the next day, ooh, it smells like a wet towel. It starts to smell weird and gross. That's because mildew is already starting to grow on it. It's a natural fiber. It's, you know, think about outside. You know, we have mildew and mold growing naturally. So because it can be attacked by mildew fairly easily, you want to make sure that you're not leaving your cotton wet um, because it can, you know, it can be attacked by mildew fairly, fairly quickly. Um, and then it gets that weird wet towel smell. And it's not just for towels. This can happen with your sheets, with your, with your linens. This can happen with your clothing, all sorts of cotton um, items. Um, silverfish. So silverfish are a type of insect. They're very similar to pincher bugs. They love water. They love moisture. Um, they also love cotton. So you can have your cotton attacked by silverfish, similar to a moth um, eating your wool. So they will you know, eat it all up. Um, the end uses of cotton include so many different apparel, interior, and industrial applications. Everything from towels, to sheets, to underwear, to sneakers, to diapers, um, to coffee filters, to the filters in your home, the filter in your car. Oh goodness, your oh, blankets. So many different applications for cotton. Um, those facial wipes that you use to take off your makeup. Um, the most important, this you know, cotton and polyester really are the two most important fibers that we utilize um, in apparel and interior applications. Uh, I definitely, I'll just say right now, make sure to watch those videos that are in the video section. Um, they're all pretty short. Some of them are a couple minutes. Some of them are maybe five minutes at the longest. Um, there are quite a few of them, but again, in order for you to kind of comprehend um, the process of taking cotton from plant and making it into a textile. Um, those videos will help you a lot. Okay, flax. Flax is something that maybe you're not familiar with. Maybe the word flax is not something that's in your vocabulary. It will become part of your vocabulary now. Um, flax is what we call a bast fiber, meaning that it comes from the stem or the stalk of the plant. Um, this is different from a seed fiber. Remember with cotton, it comes from the seed. So if you, you know, think about like a sunflower seed, um, it pops, it explodes, and all the fibers come out of the cotton seed. Um, with a bast fiber, the fiber is actually pulled from the stalk or the stem, similar to something like celery. If you think about taking a bite of celery, you kind of always get that little stringy bit that comes off with it. If you imagine taking your celery, like string cheese, and stringing it, um, that's essentially how we get um, the fiber off of a, a, um, a flax plant. Now, flax is the name of the fiber because that's the name of the plant. If you look down at the bottom right-hand corner, these are flax plants. Um, they grow oftentimes near riverbeds, um, in the warmer conditions, definitely. Once it's processed and made into fabric, we then call it linen. So you have probably heard of the word linen before. Maybe you call them your table linens or, you know, your linens um, when it comes to your home interiors. Uh, maybe you have a linen dress. Uh, maybe you have a linen blouse that you wear in the summertime or the, you know, the spring when it's warmer. Um, it is not called linen until it's fabric. So for the sake of this chapter and chapters one, two, and three, and for the exam, you want to make sure that you are talking about the fiber flax, not the fabric linen. Okay, so that's easy to um, kind of get confused. So again, we're talking about flax, the plant, um, which makes the fiber. 
Um, the staple length is quite long. We, we get 6 to 20 inches um, for, you know, the typical length of flax. Again, if you're looking at these, these reeds here, they are quite long. There's a rod, you can see that, that kind of dowel there made of wood. Um, so these are going to be, you know, feet high. They're going to be quite tall, um, like tall grass almost. Um, but when you start to pull it apart, again, think about celery, you're going to be getting anywhere from 6 to 20 inch long strands. Okay, and again, they're hair-like, so they're very fine. Again, it's cellulosic. It is a plant. It's made up of plant stuff. Um, it's bamboo-shaped. So again, when you look at it under a microscope, um, not the longitudinal configuration, but the, the shape of it, you know, when you cut it in half and you look down on the shape of the fiber, it looks like a, a, a round tube with a hole in the middle. That hole in the middle is important. Um, that's why we utilize it in the way that we do. So uh, flax is the oldest textile fiber. If you think back to you know mankind, the first civilizations, um, we think about Egyptians, right? Um, we think about, oh, their clothing. What was it made from? It was made out of linen. And again, you know, we have the rivers there in Egypt. Um, it's a hot, hot climate. They need to be wearing clothing that's cool and breathable, um, comfortable. And so that's why flax was a fiber that has been used for centuries, for thousands of years. Um, it is the oldest textile fiber, and the Egyptians used it. Um, that was their, their fiber of choice. Um, the longest producer is France, so you can get French linen, um, buttery, soft, wonderfully breathable, um, but expensive. Um, linen in general is a very expensive um, cellulosic fiber, uh, much more expensive than cotton. Um, the leading exporters are still in Europe, so we have Northern Ireland, Belgium, Italy, France is still a leading producer. So again, they're, it's going to come with a more expensive price tag, um, not produced in countries like you know, uh, Pakistan or India where, you know, the, the price point, um, because you're paying for labor there is going to be much cheaper. So in places like Europe, it's going to be more expensive to produce because you have to pay appropriately. Um, some favorable properties of flax are it's very strong. It's got a good hand and it's lustrous. Um, it's soft and it does have a bit of sheen to it. And the reason why it has a little bit of sheen is because of its shape. It's shaped like bamboo. So it's kind of a like a rod with some striations in it. And it's got a, you know, the hole in the middle. Um, this is what gives it that nice smooth hand. Um, there's not a lot of breaks or twists in it. So it feels very smooth as you run your hand over that fiber. Um, again, it picks up a lot of light because of the ability to reflect. Um, and it's hydrophobic because it's a plant and it loves water. Um, flax, just like cotton, absorbs and dries quickly. A very nice cooling effect. Very comfortable in warm weather. So we'll talk about the different seasons of um, apparel. Textiles, um, they're typically four seasons. And resort wear is one of those seasons. Or, you know, summer clothing. Um, and this is something that is used very much so in resort wear. Not only because of the fact that it has that cooling effect. Um, and it's comfortable in warm weather, but also because it's very luxurious, so it's very soft and has a little bit of luster, just kind of built into that fiber. So very good for resort wear. Like cotton, it is stronger when wet, which means it's launderable, which is great. Um, you do, you know, you want to pay attention to, you know, what you're adding to your laundry when you wash your linens. Um, but again, you can toss it in the wash and um, it'll come out okay because it's, you know, holds up well, stronger when wet. No static, no pilling, no lint. Again, similar to cotton. No static because it's hydrophilic. No pilling because there's no static. And no lint because it doesn't break down in that way. Cotton will create lint. Um, flax is, again, extra special. There is no lint that comes from flax. So I know, you know, we all have dust bunnies and we think about that. Most of that is made out of skin particles. But a lot of that is the fibers around you that are breaking down and creating lint. Um, a beautiful thing about flax is that it does not produce lint. It doesn't break down in that way. Again, adding to the price tag because it's a great favorable property. Um, some unfavorable properties. It doesn't have great drape. So even though it does have a little bit of luster and has that little bit of sheen because of the shape of it, it doesn't drape very well. So when you think about a linen outfit, let's say you think about a linen suit or a linen dress or a linen blouse, 
Um, not a lot of drape to it most of the time. They're very structured, um, not a lot of flowiness to it. Um, poor elasticity like cotton, you can't stretch it out and it doesn't bounce back. Um, poor resiliency, so again, like cotton, if you bunch it up, take that linen blouse, you're going on vacation, you crumple it up in a ball, put it in your luggage, when you go to pull it out of your luggage, it's still going to be crumpled up. So it doesn't have the resiliency to be able to bounce back very quickly. Um, it is vulnerable to mildew and silverfish, just like cotton. Again, it is a cellulosic. It's essentially a plant. That's what it's made from. Um, and it's less abrasion resistant than cotton. So that's one of the unfavorable properties that, you know, is uh, um, less favorable than cotton itself. So one of the key differences there. Um, and uses include things like dresses, suits, luxury table linens, and wallpaper. Um, we use it in wallpaper oftentimes, um, in more expensive wallpaper, I should say. Um, it traditionally was what wallpaper was made from. Um, and it's uh, a lot to do with the way that it holds up, um, the way that it can be shaped, um, colored, so imprinted. Um, and then when you think about your table linens, not often made from linen nowadays, <clears throat> linens although we say the word linen, um, are typically made from cotton. Um, but those luxury table linens are still made from the flax fiber. Okay, silk. Silk is an amazing fiber. Um, it's just, you know, mind-blowing how it's created. There are some great videos in, again, the visual, um, the video page of the module. Um, please watch the one on silk. Um, it just, it's just mind-blowing how you know this process happens. So silk is a continuous strand of filament fiber, meaning that when you properly um, process silk, you can get one strand of fiber that can be miles long. So the only natural filament fiber that does this is silk. Um, no other natural fiber can grow to this length. It just doesn't happen in nature. Um, if you think about your human hair, if you were to use human hair for um, fiber production, that would be considered a natural fiber. Even a human to grow their hair and never cut it their entire life, it would never be miles long. Um, if you were to think about a flax plant, if you were to let that piece of grass flax grow 100 feet tall, you still would not have a continuous strand that could be miles long. Um, silk is the only natural fiber that does this. And again, it can be up to 160 yards in length, so you're looking at 3,500 feet in length from one silk cocoon. So we'll talk about what silk is and where it comes from. Talked about it a little bit um, in chapter two. But it is a protein fiber, meaning that it comes from an animal, um, a worm actually. So the fiber is produced by a silk worm, which then would become a moth. Um, we kind of, we typically tend to stop that, that stage, um, that life cycle, um, in order to take the uh, filament from it. So. This is a protein fiber produced by the silkworm. It is naturally white in color or slightly off-white because of, um, we'll talk about the, the saracen, which is a gummy substance on the outside of the cocoon, causes a yellow or grayish color. But once that saracen is washed away, it has this natural white look to it, um, which is you know a wonderful, a very favorable property because then you don't have to bleach it, which is another step that we can delete from the process and save some money and time. Um, China is a leading producer, has been, and you know probably will continue to be. I'm sorry about that. My computer's connected to my phone. Um, raw silk has not had the Saracen removed. So there are instances where we don't remove the Saracen, which is, again, that kind of sticky substance that's used to hold the cocoon together. Sometimes we don't get rid of it. Sometimes we leave it on and it produces what we call raw silk. Um, and that's favorable sometimes. Um, it's a, definitely a darker color. It's a beige or a tan or brown almost. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about the different reasons why you would want um, different types of silk. Okay, so um, silk is a staple fiber when the cocoon is broken. So what happens, sorry, I'm going to go back up. Just for a second, you're going to watch a video on it, but just so that I can kind of describe it to you. Within this cocoon here is a is a worm, is a silkworm. Um, the silkworm doesn't start out in a cocoon. It starts out at a larva stage. Well, there's an egg and then a larva stage. Um, the larva eat and eat and eat and eat until they become a worm. Um, and then once they get to um, a certain life cycle stage, a certain age, they then are going to go into their chrysalis, which would be this cocoon here, like a, similar to a butterfly. 
Um, and in order to protect themselves for this, this changing stage where they will change from a silkworm into a moth, um, they need to create their cocoon. And to do this, they extrude the, um, the silk protein out of holes on their head. So they have these pores essentially on the head of the um, silkworm. Um, silk protein is extruded. Also, sericin is extruded at the same time. Um, the silk protein and the sericin are kind of, you know, um, oh, I don't know how to even describe this. If you have, you know, a rope that's dipped in a paint, so you can kind of imagine it. Um, or if you ever, um, oh, they have like lamps that you can make out of yarn and you dip it in Elmer's glue and it holds its shape. That's essentially what the sericin does for this silk fiber. It binds it together and so it extrudes the silk fiber. So that protein um, with the sericin out of its head wraps itself, it's kind of rolling in this um, substance and wraps its body, its silkworm body, and creates its own cocoon. And that's why we get 3,500 feet, 1,600 yards in length and, you know, on average um, because that worm is going to take its time to wrap its body in this protein. Um, it needs to be protected. It then will change so it goes through you know that process um sorry my apologies again um of changing from a silkworm to a moth within that cocoon um but we often don't let that happen so um if again if you are to let the worm um, go through the process of changing into a moth and then the moth breaks from the cocoon like it would in nature, you would then end up with staple fibers. So you'd end up with a bunch of short broken fibers that came from that broken cocoon. Um, also at the beginning and the end of the cocoon, there are staple fibers that come from kind of just the broken ends or from around the machinery where waste just kind of builds up. You will also find staple fibers. That's not how we like to use silk. We prefer to have unbroken silk but we will still use all those broken fibers. I'm so sorry. Let me see if I can turn that off. Uh, notifications. Let's see if I can silence my notifications. Uh, I don't know how to silence my notifications. I apologize. Hopefully they won't keep coming through. Um, so, silk, staple silk fibers are spun into yarn sometimes, and then we get something like silk knoll. So if you look here, you can see, oh yeah, this is kind of kind of bunched up, kind of tangly, not the prettiest, not the smoothest, um, but we still will use this. We will use all of these fibers and we'll make them into something. Um, silk is so luxurious and so expensive to produce. Um, we really don't like to waste any of it. So you can see kind of the difference between what we call silk knoll, which are staple fibers, Tussa silk, which is what we call raw silk, and then cultivated silk, which is the silk that has been processed the most. Okay, in order to achieve, in order to get cultivated silk, we have to stop the process of the worm and moth breaking the cocoon. So there are some days um, between, you know, the you know the final production of the cocoon to the moth breaking out of it. And within those few days, in order to produce this pretty cultivated silk, we have to kill the silkworm in the cocoon so that we can keep the, 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 the fiber length long um, and filament length. So sericulture, this is the process of raising and cultivating silkworms under controlled environments and a diet of mulberry leaves. So in the process of sericulture, Worms are bred, so all the way from the egg to the larva to then the worm. They are raised, essentially, in these different types of facilities. They are fed only mulberry leaves their entire life. All they eat are mulberry leaves, nothing else. They then create their cocoons, and once the cocoon is done, once they know that the, that the worm is now going to sit there dormant for a few days before it becomes a moth, we then take that silk warmed cocoon and we put it into boiling water which kills the silkworm but it allows us to find the end of the filament strand and then we can pull the cocoon apart by that single strand and essentially we're unraveling it as if you were to take maybe like thread from a spool of you know a spool of sewing thread and just let it kind of unroll you're not going to cut it into pieces you're just going to let that thread come off of that 
spool and you're going to use it long and that's essentially what we do so in the end we end up with a bunch of dead worms that have been boiled to death unfortunately um, although that's how we get this long beautiful fiber so sericulture silkworms produce the finest most lustrous smoothest fiber uniform and triangular in shape and that's why silk has such a soft hand why it's so lustrous so much shine um, and just has really good um, properties. Um, Tussa silk or um, wild or uncultivated silk is a little bit different than that. Um, natural or wild silk, um, it's formed, it's created from worms who are fed a mixture of oak and cherry leaves. So they're not on a mulberry leaf diet. Um, these silkworms are kind of, you know, out eating, you know, whatever they can find, whatever is around them. Um, it's still a process, so they still are, you know, fed primarily just oak and cherry leaves. Um, but it produces a flat, um, a darker brown color, non-uniform, less lustrous fiber, but it results in a heavier, rougher fabric. So sometimes tussa silk is more desirable. So again, that soft, silky, buttery silk is wonderful for certain applications, but sometimes having a really strong fiber like silk would be great if it were heavier and a little bit rougher. So Tussa silk or silk knoll fiber, um, you know, again, it's got a little bit of a rougher, heavier hand. Um, another type of silk is called silk, silk dupioni. So dupioni, duo, uh, means that two silkworms have nested together in one cocoon. So again, this happens, you're close, they're, you know, the worms are close to each other, close to their neighbor, and they end up spinning into one cocoon. That happens. Um, but what what ends up happening to the final product, to the final fabric, is that um, it ends up looking irregular. So the filament, because it's two together, two mixed, um, two worms that have mixed their, you know, their silk proteins, um, it has a, a very thick and thin appearance. So, gosh, let's think of something that has that appearance in nature. Um, if you were to think about... Oh goodness, I'm trying to think of something that is thick and thin. There's not a lot of things out there that are like this. Um, but I guess if you were to take, let's say, like a, a piece of yarn and if you were to dip it into wax um, and just kind of, you know, let it dry and go in and out, it's going to have thickness here and there. Um, and that's what happens when you have these two worms. In some areas it's smooth and they're, you know, uniform. And in some areas they get kind of bunched up. And um, when you have the actual final fabric, you end up with these kind of lumps and bumps. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely heavier um, and a little bit coarser because of these bumps and lumps. Um, but still, you know, it is a desirable fabric. So do peony silk, I think of duo, two silkworms together. Um, favorable characteristics for silk include excellent drape it just falls beautifully with a great cascading um, luxurious hand um, it's lustrous so it has a lot of shine to it because of its natural shape it has that triangular shape which means that it has three sides that are flat that have the ability to pick up a ton of reflected light um, it is hydrophilic again it's an animal animals need water to survive it does like water um, very little static and no peeling so there is the potential for some static when it comes to silk, but no peeling because it doesn't break um, like some of the manufactured fibers will. Unfavorable properties, it has fair resiliency and fair abrasion resistance. It's not super strong like something like cotton or flax. It's actually weaker when wet. So a lot of times when you're talking about proteins, they are always weaker when wet. And I like to think about your hair. Um, hopefully you know that you're not supposed to brush your hair when it's wet. If you brush your hair when it's wet, you will cause breakage. Um, you're supposed to let your hair dry and then you can brush it. Um, that's because it's protein and a protein, you know, doesn't hold up well when wet. It does have the ability to break apart. Um, silk is a protein, so not, um, you know, not strong when wet, weaker when wet. Um, poor resiliency to sunlight and moths. So sunlight does break down the fiber just in general. It also um, removes color. Um, it's just not good. Silk needs to be um, protected. So oftentimes if, let's say, you're interested in being a museum curator for textiles, um, oftentimes in museums, if there is a silk garment, it is held under very soft light. Um, 
no natural sunlight will get to it. Um, and that's the only way that you'll be able to preserve it, um, poor resistance to sunlight. And again, to moths, because I know it might sound weird, but um, oftentimes, you know, the silkworm or the moth will eat the leftover cocoon. It's just a protein. It's, you know, um, something for them to eat. So moths will eat silk. Um, it's difficult to preserve over time. So it does tend to degrade um, if it's in, it's, if in, if it's in um, undesirable um, settings. So that makes it hard to preserve and it's expensive to produce. It has to be imported. China is the leading producer. We do not produce any silk here in the States. So it's always going to be imported for us. Um, and it's just a long lengthy process. You have to wait for a silkworm to, to, to hatch from an egg and to become larva. And then it goes into the, the worm stage and then it has to create that cocoon. And then someone has to go through the very tedious process of removing that filament fiber from the cocoon without breaking it. So it's very expensive. That's why silk has a very um, big price tag connected to it. Um, the end uses for silk include apparel like dresses and ties, blouses, shirts, expensive apparel items. Um, and then home furnishes, uh, home furnishings, um, especially decorative items like pillows and luxury bed sheets. Um, this video here is wonderful. Um, if you want to, you know, you can copy and paste this. Um, it's also linked in the video section. This is a great video to watch on the life cycle and the processing of silk. Okay, wool. Um, wool is the hair that covers sheep. Um, it is a protein fiber because it's hair. Again, whenever we're talking about proteins, think about your own hair. Your hair is a protein. Your fingernails are protein. You are protein. You know, we are we are meat essentially as humans, and so are sheep, and so are you know silkworms. So protein fibers. Um, wool is a protein fiber. It is the hair that covers sheep. Um, it can be anywhere from 1 to 18 inches long, which is really long when you think about that. Um, but again, if you think about human hair, it also can be anywhere from you know less than an inch to 20, 18, 20 inches long. Um, naturally, it can be cream, black, or brown. If you think about the differences in human hair color, that's very similar to the differences in sheep co colored hair, when you have the fur of the sheep. Um, it can be tons of different colors. So you see down here at the bottom, wool and specialty wool fibers of different colors. Wool colors are available in many different shades of gray and brown. The natural colored wool, um, uh, the naturally colored wool do not require dry, uh, dyeing. So if you wanted to keep the wool, these, you know, shades of, you know, neutrals, um, you wouldn't have to dye it. So you wouldn't have to bleach it, which would be great. Um, it has a scaly surface. So just like human hair, it is scaly. Um, I always like to talk about those Pantene Pro-V commercials that they used to play. I don't know if they have them anymore, but they take a human hair strand that would be super scaly and falling apart almost, looking like a mess, and then one application of Pantene Pro-V, and it's smooth as a metal tube, um, and that's kind of the way that, uh, uh, you know, wool looks. If you look at the microscopic image of it on the top right-hand corner, you can see lots of scales. This is not a bad thing though. We actually utilize this scaly fiber um, and we make good use of that, that property. It's got a round shape. So if you look at the bottom, if you look at that cut microscopic shape, the cross section, you can see that it's very round and it's very thick. So it's a dense, dense fiber. Um, again, we like that. We're gonna utilize that, that, that um, characteristic of wool. And it naturally has a crimp to it. So if you're looking at the longitudinal configuration, it just naturally has a kind of a zigzag appearance. Um, you might not remember the crimper, but a crimper was a type of like a curling iron back in the 80s, very popular. Sorry about that again. Um, and it created a zigzag shape in your hair. Well, sheep just naturally kind of have that zigzag shape. It's how they get that kind of fluffy appearance. Um, again, we utilize these things, these, these characteristics of wool for the certain applications. Um, there are a ton of different types of sheep that produce wool, about 40 different breeds. Um, wool is graded on its fiber fineness and length, so depending on how thick or thin the diameter is of the fiber, we'll separate it. And then the length of it, is it a short one, two inch long, or was this, you know, does this sheep have really long hair, and are we putting it in that 18 to 20 inch long bin? So separate, separated via its fineness, diameter size, and then its length. Um, wool is also sorted according to where it's located on the fleece. So when you look at the sheep, and I'm going to kind of scroll down a little bit, but when you look at this, you know, 
this is a puny little sheep here. Um, you can kind of just see naturally, ooh, the belly side of the sheep is very dirty. The back and the shoulders in here in this upper area, much cleaner. So like you see here, oops, sorry. Um, wool is assorted according to where it's located. The best comes from the back, the sides, and the shoulders. Um, because those are the areas where it's not rubbing against the dirty grass, it's not laying on those areas typically. Um, best areas. You can, again, you're still going to remove, you're still going to shear the, the hair from the legs, from the belly, from the head, which again has the ability to rub on different surfaces. But that best, the best and cleanest of the hair is going to come from the back. Um, these are the different trademarks here. So you might see this wool mark, wool mark blend, or wool blend. Um, you maybe you've seen these before. They're similar to like the cotton um, logo. Um, they're pretty recognizable, especially if you're one you know who tends to look at your tags. You may have seen this um, on your tags before. Um, there are different types of wool, like lamb's wool or moreno wool. You may have heard of both of these before. Um, lamb's wool is the wool taken from sheep before they're a year old, or what we call the first clip. Um, very soft. So again, you know, you think about baby hair versus adult hair. Baby's hair is so fine and so soft. Um, this is the same thing with lamb's wool. When you do the first clip, when you take the hair off of the sheep when they're a little, you know, little tiny lamb, um, the diameter is thin. It's very small diameter, very fine. Um, and it makes for very soft fabric, very soft fiber. Moreno wool is a well-known breed of sheep. Um, it's considered to have the best grade of wool. It's got great drape, most crimp, most strength, best resiliency, best elasticity, and the softest hand. And that's a moreno wool, that's a moreno sheep right there. So that is the moreno wool that you will remove from the sheep. And you can kind of see, oh wow, his hair is very long. So very long, um, grows faster than your typical, you know, sheep. Again, lots of different breeds of sheep that create wool. Um, but the moreno wool is one that's very common. Um, some favorable properties, it has good resiliency. So if you were to take a wool sweater, so let's say you have a cardigan made out of wool, and if you were to crumple it up and throw it in your luggage, and then you were to travel and then take it out of your luggage, it would be pretty wrinkle resistant. It would be pretty okay. You take it out, you throw it on the bed, those wrinkles are going to come out of it pretty quickly. It's got fairly good drape, so it actually hangs pretty well. Um, it's got good elasticity, so unlike cotton and flax, um, it actually does kind of stretch and then bounce back. The reason for this is because of the shape. So if you're looking at this naturally crimped shape of wool, it's got that zigzag appearance, you have more room to stretch and then it bounces back to the zigzag shape. So it does have quite good elasticity. Hydrophilic because it's from an animal and animals love water. It's warm, and it's warm because of that, that, that cut shape, that cross-section shape of it. It's a circle, and it's a dense tube. So it is full of that protein you know, fiber. It's just solid, um, makes it very warm, which makes it a good insulator because of its natural crimp, because of its natural bulk. Um, this is, it tends to be a very warm fiber, um, and it's strong, okay, so it holds up well. Unfavorable, it has poor luster. You're not going to use wool for something that you want to have some sheen to it. It's just not going to happen. It's too too crimped, so it's got that you know that zigzag appearance. It's too scaly. I'm not going to pick up any light in that regard. Um, it's just not going to have any shine. It's actually weaker when wet. Again, think about human hair. This is a protein. You're not supposed to brush your hair when it's wet. And you're not supposed to brush a sheep's hair when it's wet either. So weaker when wet. Um, and that's why we don't launder. That's why we do not wash wool. That's one of the reasons it's weaker when it's wet. It also goes through a process called felting. So it usually shrinks in felt unless it's dry cleaned. So you don't want to get it wet because you don't want felting to occur. So felting occurs when the presence of heat, moisture, and agitation are all mixed together with wool fibers, and it causes the scales to interlock with each other. And it creates just a tangled mess, mass on the surface, just a mess, essentially, and it can't be undone. That is not a good thing all the time. So sometimes when you have something that felts, if felting occurs, let's say you take a cardigan, a cute cardigan, and you wear it, and you gotta wash it, and smell it, and you get a little dirty. You decide to throw it in the laundry, and you're rubbing it around, and it's a cool cycle. You, you don't put it in hot water, but it's being agitated, and that water is, because of agitation, there's gonna be some heat that's gonna happen anyways. 
that's going to cause your cute little cardigan to essentially get all smooshed together and become almost like a sponge. The fabric and the fiber is no longer going to be sitting apart from each other. It's not going to um, lay nice and feel good. It's going to feel like a matted mess. Um, and that's called felting. Uh, it's not desirable when it's, you know, when it happens after laundering or when it happens um, to something that's already been produced. But we sometimes like felt. So we'll talk about felt in another second. Um, super washed wool is wool that will not felt because it's gone through so many processes before it's been made into fabric that it doesn't have the ability to felt. Um, not super common and very expensive. So if you look here, felting, shrinkage in a wool sweater. So original size is on the left and the size after you accidentally threw it in the laundry. Look at the difference of the surface too. So much more um, texture and it's just going to be itchier and it's going to feel like a Brillo pad really. So this is something you can't undo. The sweater washed in warm water and tumbled dried shrank due to that, that process of felting. The sweater outline was drawn with a red marker prior to washing and you can see, wow, look at the difference in the size. We lost so much on the shoulder, so much on the length, and even overall just the thick, the, the width of it. Um, and if you look at the material itself, it just is no longer comfortable. So that's why you're not allowed to launder wool. Some more unfavorable properties would be it's vulnerable to moths. It peels easily and it's expensive. Again, similar to like the silkworm, you have to wait for it to grow. You got to feed it. You have to do, you got to go through the processing. Um, it's expensive. Same thing with wool. You have to raise the sheep. You have to feed them their entire life. You have to give them land. You then have to shear them once or twice a year, depending on the breed. And then you got to wait to shear it again to get more wool from that animal. So it's a long process and it's an expensive process. Um, sil um, silk, sorry. Wool does pill easily, so it does break. Think about your own hair. You have breakage every day. Think about putting it up in a ponytail and taking it down. You're going to have just natural breakage. You know, hair's wrapped around those rubber bands. It happens. Um, because of that breakage and because of the fact that it's scaly, wool does have a problem with pills. The broken fibers on the surface that kind of get bunched up into a ball from rubbing, and then they stick. And that's what we call a pill. So, um, you know, a problem with pills also vulnerable to moth. It's a protein. We talked about how, you know, that silkworm, which becomes a moth, they like protein. That's what they eat. So if you have wool clothing, you may notice that in that magnified view, there are holes there, moth damage, because again, they're trying to eat it. <laughs> End uses include coats, suits, sweaters, carpeting, luxury upholstery, and felt fabric. So we'll talk about felt a little bit later. <clears throat> but true felt fabric comes from 100% wool fibers. And although we just talked about, ooh, we don't like felting. Felting is not good for clothes. Well, no, it's not necessarily good for clothing or for anything that's already been produced. But if you produce wool to make it into felt, then it's desirable. So we'll talk about felt fabric a little bit later. Other natural fibers that come from hair um, or the hair of different types of animals, specialty hair fibers include angora, which comes from this little rabbit right here. Beautifully soft. Um, I mean, just the cutest little rabbit you've ever seen. Alpaca, um, camel hair, cashmere, which comes from these cute little cashmere goats right here. Um, a very soft cashmere, you know, that is a luxury fiber. It's expensive. Um, and again, now you got to think like, oh, it comes from a goat. So yeah, special. Um, mohair, which comes from the Angora goat. So a different type of goat. Um, a kiviot, which is this large animal here, similar to almost like a bison. Uh, the kuna and yak. So these are different larger animals where you can shear them and you can remove the fiber and you can create specialty fabrics from those specialty hair fibers. Um, all of these are very expensive. Um, bass fibers, just to kind of reiterate, there are different fibers um, that we can pull from different types of plants that come from the stem or the stalk. So flax is not the only bass fiber that we utilize. Bamboo is an example of a bass fiber. We use the stalk of the bamboo and we can process it so that we can use it to make fabric. Um, we'll talk about bamboo a little bit more, but bamboo is requires quite a bit of um, manufacturing. Um, so you can't just simply peel the, the fibers off of the bamboo plant. It needs to be made into pulp first, which is difficult because if you've ever felt bamboo, you know how firm it is. Bamboo is incredibly strong, which is great 
you know, when you make it into a textile because it, it still contains that strength characteristic. But in order to make bamboo into fiber, it does require quite a bit of processing. Flax is the most important of the bass fibers. It's the most widely used. Hemp, um, which is becoming more popular, uh, which is a wonderful fiber. Um, it requires almost no water to grow it. It grows incredibly fast. Um, very similar to, you know, the way that we pull um, flax fiber from the stalk. Jute and ramy, very similar to flax. These are just different types of plants um, that are slightly different. They're a little bit coarser. Um, they don't have a soft hand, as soft of a hand as flax does, but very, very similar in the processing. Um, leaf fibers. So bast fibers, again, those come from the stem or the stalk. Seed fibers come from the seed. It kind of explodes out of the seed. Um, protein fibers come from an animal. And then a leaf fiber is taken from the leaf section of the plant. <clears throat> so something like banana. You're not actually taking the peel of the banana or the fruit of the banana or the seed or the stalk. You're taking the leaf of the banana. So if you've ever had a banana plant in your house, it's very palm-like. It's a large um, oval-shaped leaf. Um, you could take that leaf and you can peel it apart, pull it into pieces, and it creates this bamboo fiber. Um, similar to pineapples, this is a, you know, the pineapple leaf is used, similar process. Yucca, which creates sisal um, or sisal. Um, this is a rough, coarse, and woody fiber. Um, oftentimes it's used in mats and rugs and wall coverings um, in decorative um, purposes. And this is it here. It almost looks like a, um, like a palm or like a succulent. Um, it is very coarse, but again, you can kind of peel it apart. Um, the fiber itself is quite large, and so it almost always um, is almost a woven or looks woven um, because it's used in things, again, that are like rugs and mats and decorative purposes. Um, very coarse. Um, mineral fibers are another characteristic, or sorry, another category of natural fibers. They're not as popular, especially the number one mineral fiber that we're going to talk about, which is asbestos. So you have probably heard of the word asbestos. Um, it's actually not very common anymore, thank goodness. Um, most buildings that utilize asbestos, they know that it's in the building and they have begun to remove it or have removed it. It was really widely used in the late 1800s to the 1980s. So for 100 years, asbestos was a go-to fiber. Um, <clears throat> You can shape it very easily, so it was used in construction of buildings from everything from plumbing to walls to ceiling insulation to siding to tile to roof shingles. It was used all over in building construction. Um, the reason why is because, again, it's easy to shape, it's dense, it's inherently fireproof, which is great for a building structure. Why not build an entire house out of something that's fireproof? That would be awesome. But we did not know back then that it is a carcinogen. So it causes a cancer called mesothelioma. You may be, I don't know, depending on how old you are, you maybe remember the commercials that say, if you suffer from mesothelioma, you can you know, call this number um, because it probably was connected to asbestos. Um, Again, it is cancer causing, um, and it's not cancer causing when it is um, solid. So once you take asbestos, the fiber, and you shape it into, let's say, a tile, that's fine. But the moment that the tile starts to degrade and starts to fall apart, the fiber that is in the air, that airborne particulate, then gets lodged essentially into your lungs so it becomes airborne so you're breathing it in it goes into the lungs and then it calls mesothelioma which is essentially a really very painful cancer um, so for these buildings that were you know older buildings that were starting to fall apart that needed repair um, very very dangerous so we do not use asbestos anymore we now know after you know after creating all these buildings, the building started to degrade. Then we realized that, oh no, as it's degrading and as we're, you know, um, remodeling or fixing or taking down or pulling apart these asbestos tiles and insulation and whatnot, it's causing even more damage. So it is something um, we no longer use. Um, 
Oh, another another mineral fiber that we'll talk about a little later on is lame, um, like aluminum. That's an example of a mineral fiber that we can use. Um, there are different types of um, almost think about metal essentially, or um, or like a rock almost. It's it's got that kind of you know look or appearance to it. Um, but asbestos is the most common one that you will you probably know of. Okay, so those are the natural fibers. Um, we're going to talk about manufactured fibers in just a second, but we're going to talk about, talk about this micron system. This is the system that we use in order to measure the diameter or the fineness of a fiber. The smaller the micron number, the finer the fiber. So it's a um, direct system. So size one means it's a very fine fiber. Um, a smaller number does not always indicate quality. So just because it's really fine doesn't mean that it's really good. You know, we do think about things like, oh, it's such a fine fiber. It's so soft. Um, that's not always the case. That doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it doesn't always connect to quality. Um, it usually starts with the place of origin. So um, if you think of something like cashmere, which has a fine, um, you know, um, diameter or small micron number, yes, that does attach to quality, but it also is from, you know, the animal that it's coming from. So there's other things that are connected to that quality. Um, manufactured fibers. They have generic names, which the FTC establishes. So to receive a new generic name from the STC, a fiber must have physical properties and chemical composition that are very different from other fibers already on the market. So in order to have a generic name, you have to be very different from any other generic name that's already out there. There are very few generic names, new ones. The reason why there are very few new generic fibers is because we've already kind of created all the different fibers um, from the different um, chemical and physical you know, properties. So we have protein fibers. We have cellulosic fibers. We have straight up chemical fibers, which we call manufactured fibers. In order for a fiber to have a different generic name, it has to have different and enough difference to make a difference, you know, to make it important, it has to have enough physical properties and chemical composition to be able to put it into a different category. And that's not very common anymore. Um, they do, they do occur every once in a while, but it's very rare to have a new generic fiber. Okay. So we'll talk about the generic categories and then we'll talk about the trademarks underneath those. So generic means pencil. A pencil is a generic name for a item that you hold in your hand that has lead in it that you can write with. But there are different types of pencils. You can have a lead pencil, or you can have a mechanical pencil. You can have a, a, a 0.6 or a 0.7 mechanical pencil. You can have a number two pencil. You can have a number four pencil. You can have a, a graphite pencil. You can have a color pencil. Lots of different pencils, but in the generic category, it is a pencil. And then there are these subcategories below them, which we call the trademark when it comes to fiber. So we're going to talk about that. So the marketing of manufactured fibers. Um, there are commodity fibers. So these are fibers used without identification or source, and they're sold to any buyer on the open market. Essentially, you can think of this as, okay, cotton. I'm going to go to the store, and I'm going to buy cotton. I'm going to buy a big old bag of cotton. Um, or you can go to the store, and you can buy American Pima cotton. Well, that then has a name attached to it. So the, 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 the difference between those two. The commodity fibers are going to be cheaper. You can buy a big old bag of cotton when it's a commodity fiber. I don't know who made it. I don't know what the name of it is. I don't know who it's connected to for marketing wise. It's just cotton. It's kind of this just like basic commodity fiber. Cheaper. The cheapest way to purchase manufactured fibers. Um, again, this is talking about manufactured industry. We haven't talked about any of the specifics, but something like polyester. Hopefully that's a name that's easy for you to remember. I'm going to buy a bag of polyester because that's easy. I don't know who made it, but if I'm going to buy polyester that was made by, oh, I don't know, let's say um, Daikon, the company, um, I think, you know, oh, that's going to be a little bit more expensive because it has a name attached to it. Okay. Fiber trademarks, this kind of has to do with that. Are you going to attach a name to it? Um, is this, you know, polyester just a bag of polyester or is there a company who's paying to have their name connected to it? 
So fiber trademark are word or words used by a fiber producer to distinguish its fiber from fibers of the same generic class sold by others. So manufactured fibers are often identified by their trademark names. So something like spandex. Spandex is a generic fiber. Spandex is just a type of fiber. But you may have heard of the word lycra because maybe your Lululemon or your um, Nike workout pants, maybe they say the word lycra on them. Lycra is just a type of spandex, but a company owns Lycra and stamps their name on it so that you now know not only the word spandex, but you also know their, their specific trademark fiber, Lycra. The fiber producer spends money to promote the fiber by establishing a trademark. It commands a higher price. Hey, it might be very, very, very similar to the commodity spandex that you could just buy in a bag over there. All I know is it's called spandex and that's what it is. It's got to be slightly different in order to put your trademark name on it. And it's supposed to be slightly better. So there should be something that's a better quality to it. Hence why you're going to pay more for it in the long run. Most of the time you're paying for you're paying more for it because you're paying for their marketing. You're paying for all the things that go into having a name connected to it. But again, it should have better quality. Controlled trademarks. This is um, this is you know something like Dacron, which is a company that produces polyester. Um, they have controlled trademarks. This is when a fiber maker is able to control the selling and subsequent use of the fiber. You cannot buy you know Dacron polyester for anything other than safety gloves. And that's just an example. That's not true. But I'm just saying that that would be an example of a controlled trademark. You can only buy this Invista, which is you know that's the brand. Um, you can only buy this Invista polyester to make tents. That's all they'll let you use it for. That's a controlled trademark, meaning that um, the end product is controlled. The, the, the company that produces that said fiber can say what you're going to make it, what you're going to make into it, or make it into. Um, thermalite polyester, which is a thermal insulator. Um, again, this is something that's oftentimes used for for gloves or um, different type of outdoor wear, and in a lot of cases, safety wear. Okay, so that's a controlled trademark, not very common, but um, common in uh, industrial applications. Okay, principal man-made fibers. So these are, you know, the the most important ones that we're going to go over. If you're going, you know, through the book at the same time that we're doing these lectures, and you're kind of highlighting, you're going to notice oh, we're skipping some major, we're skipping some big sections here. We're missing some, um, we're missing some manufactured fibers and some paragraphs, but that's okay. These are the most important. Um, principal man-made fibers. Um, so we're going to talk about just these. I believe there are nine of them. Um, so we're going to talk about the properties of these fibers like we did for the natural and the end uses of each fiber. Acetate. Acetate, we're just going in alphabetical order. So this is the first one we're going to talk about. It's not the first manufactured fiber, but it was the second. So this is the second manufactured fiber. It was made after rayon. So it was really, really, really similar to rayon. But there were some characteristics about acetate um, that made it special. And so rayon is the first manufactured fiber ever in the history of mankind. Um, the first manufactured was rayon. And acetate was a type of rayon. It was in the rayon family. Um, until they realized that, ooh, acetate actually acts a little bit different and works in different ways. So we're going to give it its own generic category. Now, there are different types of acetate, but those are the trademark names, or those are within the generic category. So acetate is its own generic category. And again, it was the second manufactured fiber in the U.S. That's important to know. It was produced in 1924, which was almost 100 years ago, as crazy as that sounds. Um, again, it was in the Rand fiber family until it was assigned its own generic class in 1952. So, you know, it took about 25 years for it to get its own generic class. Um, it is a cellulosic fiber. So remember, we break down fibers into natural, manufactured cellulosic, and manufactured non-cellulosic. So this, because again, it was one of the first, it was made from cellulose. So again, we, we, we know how to make cotton, you know, um, we know how to make flax, that's the oldest known fiber. Um, let's take that, that cellulose and let's manipulate it with chemicals and with more processing, and let's make a different type of fiber. And that's how we got things like rayon and acetate. Um, you know, still primarily made out of cellulose, but manufactured. 
um, has a round shape with surface striations, and that's all based off of the spinneret. So the way that the spinneret is, you know, the holes are cut into it, um, is how the fiber um, is produced. So we decide that. Acetate has that round sh shape with the kind of surface striations. You almost know, you can think of bamboo almost. Acetate is favorable in its drape. It has really good drape. It is um, almost like a, it, we call it like a silk substitute. So I'm going to scroll down real quickly, but you'll see, oh, yeah, it's got like a silky look to it. So um, rayon was the first. Acetate was the second. These were both uh, meant to mimic the, the look of silk without being so expensive. So, hey, we want that excellent drape, that luxurious hand, um, but we want to be able to make it in a very expensive, inexpensive way, unlike silk. It doesn't peel, which is great, and it has a little static. Um, it is hydrophilic because it is made primarily of cellulose. So again, there are three manufactured fibers that are hydrophilic, and then everything else that's manufactured is hydrophobic. Because acetate is made up of cellulose, it is um, hydrophilic, which means it still likes water. Not as much as natural ones do, but it still likes water, um, which allows it to have little static, so it still has a little moisture in there. Um, unfavorable, it's got poor strength. Uh, acetate is not strong, period. Acetate is known for being a very weak fiber. It also has poor abrasion resistance, which means that when you start to rub acetate together, it breaks down and causes holes fairly quickly. It also has poor elasticity, which means it does not stretch well. Um, it has a very firm, you know, st not stiff, but just like um, set in its way. It's not going to stretch at all. Um, low wet strain. So it's not strong when wet. It's highly thermoplastic, meaning that it can melt with just a little bit of heat. So very easy to melt it if you're ironing it, let's say. And it easily fades or changes colors. <laughs> it easily changes in colors based off of environmental conditions, off of sweat, off of rubbing. It just doesn't hold up very well. So although acetate is great because it's an inexpensive silk looking fabric, it's very cheap. It's just inexpensive and it does not hold up well. So its end uses typically include things like suit lining fabrics. So if you think about the inside of a suit, especially a cheap suit, um, if you're buying a blazer, let's say at somewhere like Forever 21 or Target, the inside of that blazer is probably gonna be lined with acetate. And you'll realize that, ooh, after not wearing it very often, but after wearing it for, you know, a month or so, they're going to start to get a hole in the armpit where your arm rubs up against, you know, your arm, your um, body. And that's because it has poor abrasion resistance. You may also notice that if the lining is pink, the pink is starting to fade away in the areas like the armpit or the back, or maybe you're sweating and the moisture is pulling the color away from it. Um... If you are to launder it, you will realize that, oh my goodness, it just falls apart in the wash and becomes a tangled mess of fibers. So suit linings, cheap especially, graduation gowns, something you're not going to wash or wear very often, backing fabrics for some bonded materials where it's just the back of it, it's not the front of it, so it doesn't need to look good. Um, but it is, again, it is a cheap silk substitute. When I say cheap, I mean cheap. Acrylic, again, we're going in alphabetical order here, so um, acrylic is the next. This is known as a wool replacement. So if you think about acrylic, I love to think about acrylic nails. Acrylic nails are supposed to be your human nail, your protein, but it's fake. It's made up. You're giving yourself fake nails. So acrylic, again, it's a wool replacement, less expensive than wool because you don't have to raise sheep and water them and feed them. So again, it's easy to make because it's made out of chemicals. And it's also washable. So there's that pro to it too. So it's less expensive than wool and it's washable unlike wool. Wool, again, if you wash it, it will felt, which is not good. But oftentimes when we have, let's say, a cardigan, we're going to wear it and maybe we get warm and we're going to get sweaty and we're going to want to wash it. And so acrylic is a great substitute for wool because it is warm, um, but it can be washed. It has a round shape with a smooth surface. So unlike um, wool, it's not scaly. It's not crimped. So it's not itchy. So you might notice that in your sweaters, in your cardigans, in your wool coats, you have a mixture of wool and acrylic. And why would they do that? Well, they do it for a couple of reasons. They do it to make it less expensive so that you're not using all wool. But then they also make it to feel better. The acrylic is going to be softer and not as itchy as the wool will be. So it's a nice um, kind of mixture. Sorry, get that out of there. Um, favorable properties, it's lightweight. It's got good drape like wool does. It's warm, just like wool. 
it's got good resiliency so you could bunch it up into a ball and pull it back out and it'll be pretty good just like wool it is resistant to sunlight so that's great and it's washable which is amazing so acrylic is really a great manufactured fiber um, I mean manufactured fibers have cons up the wazoo because they are essentially just made out of chemicals and it's just not good for the environment but when it comes to a synthetic fiber acrylics a nice one because it does have good characteristics unfavorable it's hydrophobic because it is completely made out of chemicals it does not like water so it's hydrophobic afraid of water so it does have problems with static and peeling so these become problems so if the fiber breaks down and because there's no water or moisture in there to stop the static electricity from happening the broken down fibers are going to cling together and get stuck to the surface causing pills um, it only has fair strength and abrasion resistant so it's not super strong or super abrasion, resi abrasion resistant um, different than you know wool but its end uses are similar it's used for sweaters and blankets and carpeting children's garments outdoor products such as awnings and tents um, acrylic is widely used so again it's what we call the wool substitute Okay, Lyocell. Lyocell is a new age fiber. So a couple of you, when you turned in your articles um, for um, new you know, textile technology, um, you pulled up articles about Lyocell. Lyocell is made by the company Lensing, which is just a fiber producer. Um, and it's actually considered a subclass of rayon, but it gets its own generic category because it is so different. So again, rayon was the first manufactured fiber and it is primarily made out of cellulose. So you take a wood pulp from a tree essentially and you break it down and you make rayon. Well, you're gonna do something very similar to that. You're gonna take wood pulp and you're gonna create fiber from it. But because the processing is different from Lyocell, the spinning process creates less water and air pollution than any other processing for you know, rayon or acetate or any of these other subcategories. It got its own category. So Lyocell is what we call like the new age um, rayon. Um, it's the strongest of the cellulosic fibers and shrinks less. So of these manufactured cellulosics, it's the strongest. It uses the least water and it uses a little and it causes the least air pollution. So it's really like the green manufactured fiber. It's like the new age clean manufactured fiber. Um, it's stronger when wet, which is great. And it creates luxurious, lustrous fabric with good drape in hand. So it makes for a silk substitute again, similar to rayon and acetate. Um, and better for the environment and feels better and so again it's gonna you know cause a more expensive price tag but you know good overall there's some unfavorable properties to all fibers so not abrasion resistant so it doesn't hold up well to wear surface splinters do happen and again if you think about the fact that it's made from cellulose this kind of makes sense um, so surface splinters can happen which will then cause peeling and fuzziness so you want to make sure that you are um, caring for this properly so oftentimes something made from lyocell will say to dry clean only um, color changes and changes in hand can occur due to the splintering so again not something that's good um, and it's vulnerable to mildew and insects because again this is primarily 100 percent of its um, beginning um, stages is made from cellulose mostly made for apparel um uh, lyocell again is it is a trademark name made from the company tensile which um or made under the name tensile from the company lensing um we call it the new age fiber so tensile is the trademark name for lyocell lyocell is this new generic category and it is produced solely by um, the company lensing manufacturers okay so the new age fiber so we've got that and then you got the green and then the water Nylon. Nylon was a, you know, the third manufactured fiber and produced in the United States. Um, I love this little illustration down here, this little advertisement here for DuPont nylon. Um, manufactured first in 1939, right before the war. Um, second most used fiber in the United States. It's got a rod-like shape with a smooth surface. Again, it is a manufactured fiber, so we decide that. We decide that it's a rod-like shape with a smooth surface. It was created 
and then it was used for a bunch of different reasons. So it is lightweight, strong, abrasion resistant. It's got good drape, good resiliency, really good elasticity, and it's launderable. So when we first produced nylon, it was primarily used in apparel, and it was made for nylon. So you used it for your, you know, those hosiery, the tights, um, underwear. It was used for apparel primarily at first. And then, sorry, again, no, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, if you, you know, if you think back to your American history, we needed nylon. We used nylon during the war. So nylon has a bunch of, bunch of uses. So you can use it in apparel, home furnishing, industrial areas. We know, we think of nylon for lingerie, swimwear, parachutes, luggage, rope, carpeting, you know, originally really for lingerie and swimwear and apparel. Um, but then it was used for different purposes later on when we needed different types of um, uh, products, essentially. Um, it does have unfavorable properties. It's hydrophobic, so it does have problems with static and cling. So, um, I mean, again, most people don't wear nylons anymore, but, you know, if you did wear nylons back in the day, if you, you know, rubbed up against your your, your bed or if you're sitting on you know, maybe your chenille couch, it causes friction because it is hydrophobic, it's afraid of water, and so things would stick to it. So you might leave the house and have a sock stuck to your leg and not notice it because of the static electricity. Um, and thus peeling too because those little balls of broken fiber stick to the surface. Um, poor resiliency to prolonged sun exposure, so it doesn't hold up well. Um, and it's funny because you think about, wait, parachutes, we were using, we, we asked women to give up their nylons um, for the war. Um, because they wanted to use them for things like parachutes and luggage and tarps and whatnot. Um, so not very long lasting for sun exposure. So it does break down fairly quickly. So again, we needed a lot of it because we needed to make a bunch of those parachutes and we needed to make them over and over and over again. So nylon, kind of a fun, crazy um, textile that's been used for many different purposes. But think about nylons. Think about nylons like the tights. Think about the, um, you know, that that application because then you can think about, oh, it does have good stretch, good elasticity, good drape, good resiliency, and it's laundrable. You can wash them. Um, olefin. Olefin is another newer fiber. It was first manufactured in 1961, so it's not too old. Um, again, rod-like shape, smooth surface. This is all dependent on the spinneret. Essentially, a spinneret is a shower head. If you look up at your shower head, most of the holes in it are circles. It's the easiest way to produce it. Um, however, it has more striations than nylon surface. Again, we are able to produce it in a certain way, but just naturally based off of what olefin comes from, it just has a surface, um, you know, indentations in it. Olefin is lightweight, strong, and abrasion resistant. It has really good resistance to sunlight and it's hydrophobic. Um, excellent wicking ability when it's thin, however. So, Olefin is not often used by itself. Olefin was produced in 1961, so it's an older fiber. It's got its own generic category, but it is often used as a blend. So when it's used in a thin state, it has excellent wicking ability, which means wicking means that it has the ability to move water from one area to another. However, olefin by itself, because it's pretty much completely hydrophobic, it doesn't like water at all, it's only good for clothing if it's blended or very, very, very thin. So again, olefin, you won't find it on its own. It's often a blend mixed with cotton or some other natural or hydrophilic fiber. Once blended, however, it's an excellent fiber for running or athletic or high-performance apparel because of its excellent wicking ability. So even though it's hydrophobic, it's still really good at taking moisture or water and moving it around. And again, that probably has something to do with that surface, those, you know, serrated surfaces and the different cuts in the, in the longitudinal configuration of the fiber. It has a low softening point. So you, you know, you have to think about its thermoplasticity, you know, it does have the ability to melt, but also has the ability to be shaped. So olefin is, again, always blended, and we utilize it for essentially workout wear. Think about athletic wear. Athletic clothing, underwear, indoor-outdoor carpeting, floor coverings, upholstery, and industrial fabrics. Again, almost always blended. Polyester is a fabric, or fiber, I'm sorry, that most of us know. It's the most commonly manufactured in the United States. It's a very commonly used, also, so manufactured and used. We love polyester. It's a wash and wear. Again, rod-like, smooth surface. We're making it through a spinneret. Polyester is essentially all chemicals. Chemicals, chemicals, chemicals. Um, but it works for what we use it for. 
So it's got favorable properties. It's strong. It's abrasion resistant. It's got good resiliency. You can bunch it up into a ball and then it, you know, opens up pretty easily. Good elasticity and it's a wash and wear fabric. You know, we use it for everything. There are some unfavorable properties to it, of course, like all fibers. It's almost completely hydrophobic. So it doesn't like water. So using polyester for something like a summer dress is not desirable. If you're wearing a summer dress and let's say, you know, you're outside and it's a sunny day, you're going to start to sweat. If you're wearing a polyester dress, the sweat is going to sit on the surface of your skin and it's not going to get absorbed into the dress. So you're going to essentially be sitting in your own sweat, not comfortable. Um, you know, it, with it being completely hydrophobic, that also means that it's hard to remove stains. Water can't get in there and soap can't get in there. And so if a stain gets onto your polyester blouse or jacket or whatever, it's going to be hard to get it out. It absorbs oil, oil, um, finish it. It absorbs oil. So I'm sorry, soil release finishes are often used. So because it absorbs oil, not water, but because oil is easy to soak into polyester because polyester is essentially oil. It's essentially, um, you know, it's a diesel. It's just a polymer. So it's made out of a fossil fuel and it's, it's just a chemical. Um, so because it's essentially like an oil, it absorbs oil. So soil release finishes are often put on the outside of polyester to make them less likely to stain. Um, but again, we use it all over the place. We use it in apparel, home furnishing, and industrial areas all the time. Suits, performance apparel, curtains, carpeting, tile cord, um, tire cord, pillow stuffing, etc. So we use it a lot. Polyester is a strong and wash and wear fabric that's easy to produce and cheap. Rayon. Rayon was the first manufactured fiber in the U.S. So rayon was the first one ever to be made, made primarily out of cellulose because it's what we had. Only viscose rayon is produced in the U.S. So, you know, the production of um, rayon here, you know, doesn't is limited to viscose, which is just a subcategory of rayon. Um, again, it's mostly cellulosic, properties similar to cotton and flax. It's hydrophilic because, again, mainly made out of cellulose. It is round and then serrated in shape. Again, we decide that based off of the shape of our spinneret. Um, rayon, it's essentially that silk substitute. Look at how beautiful and shiny and lustrous it is. So it has good strength, abrasion resistance, hydrophilic, no static or peeling problems. It's washable and it's inexpensive. Again, rayon was the first. Rayon, in my, in my opinion, is the much better uh, fiber compared to acetate. So rayon was the first, acetate was the second, second, nylon was the third. Acetate is essentially the cheaper version of rayon. Rayon is that silk substitute. We were trying to create silk in an inexpensive way, and we did a good job with rayon. There are unfavorable properties. It loses 30 to 50% of its strength when it's wet, so it's half as strong when it's wet. So, I mean, you can think about this similar to human hair, though, you know, not stronger when wet, so rayon has that issue as well. Poor elasticity poor elasticity and resilience, so it doesn't hold up too well to pooling or smooshing. High amount of shrinkage, that is something that is a poor quality, and it has to do with the fact that it's hydrophilic, so it absorbs water, which allows for lots of shrinkage. Also, again, cellulosic, so it can be attacked by silverfish and um, mold, not mild, not mild, mold. Wide range of products in the apparel industry, interior furnishes, and industrial applications. So everything from clothing, lingerie, drapes, medical products, lots of things are made out of rayon. Again, this was our very first, um, essentially our attempt at mimicking silk. Um, it's a good, strong fiber. Spandex. Spandex, it, spandex is the first of the elastomeric fibers, so one of the only elastomeric fibers. Um, Spandex is used exclusively in filament form, and the reason for that is because of its elastomeric ability. Elastomeric means that you can stretch it out to 100% and it will bounce back and be um, unaltered. So if you think about a rubber band, you can take a rubber band that has a, let's say, a circumference of 3 inches, and you could stretch it to 6 inches or 9 inches, and then it goes right back to the original shape. Um, that's how spandex works. It's elastomeric, so you can stretch it from one inch to two inches, and it should go right back to the way that it was. In order for it to stretch like that, though, you have got to keep it filament length. You cannot cut it into staple fibers. 
You can take polyester and cut it up. You can take rayon. You can take acetate. You can take lyocell. You can take olefin. You can take all of those manufactured fibers and you can cut them into pieces and you can spin them and make them into yarn and use them and make a textile that way. Or you can leave them super, super long and use them as a filament length. Spandex is the only one that we've talked about so far that you cannot cut. It exclusively use in filament form. Even silk, think about silk. That's a long filament length. We love it long in filament because it's beautiful that way, but you can cut it up and you can use it as a staple. If you were to cut up spandex, it makes it um, unusable. It defeats the purpose. It is no longer elastomeric. It's barely gonna stretch because if you cut it into teeny tiny quarter inch pieces, what, what, what good is it essentially? Um, favorable qualities of spandex, it's lightweight, excellent stretch and recovery. It is durable, it doesn't have problems with peeling or static. Very little fiber needed to make it um, into this, you know, stretchy fabric. So very little fiber needed in fabrics to realize its benefits. So if you look at a pair of workout pants, let's say, I'm wearing a pair right now, you will see that it is 90% cotton, 8% polyester, and 2% spandex. That 2% makes these workout pants very stretchy. Um, so you only need a little bit of spandex in order to realize these stretchy, you know, elastic benefits. There are unfavorable properties. It does have poor strength, so it's not that strong. It doesn't hold up super well to um, extended wear. It's hydrophobic, which means it does not like any water whatsoever. White fibers become yellow when they are exposed to air or chlorine bleach. So this is something most people don't realize. So if you have, let's say, a white sports bra and you keep you work out in it, you want to toss it in with the white clothes and you bleach it, and it comes out looking dirtier and dirtier and more and more faded and kind of yellowy, it's because it doesn't, spandex does not hold up to chlorine bleach. So anything that is white um, spandex, you do not want to actually add bleach to it. You, you know, it's a common misconception. It also has a low softening temperature, which means it can melt very easily. So you have to be mindful of what percent spandex is in the garments that you are ironing. It's also expensive to make. It's not a cheap fiber. It is quite expensive. Um, and uses include main things like undergarments, ski pants, swimwear, athletic apparel, you know, lots of things that we like stretch. The trademark name is Lycra that we know. So the main trademark for spandex is Lycra. And we oftentimes will see that on our clothing. They don't write the word spandex. They actually write Lycra because it's so recognizable. Okay, let me just, I'm just going to read about, yeah, just a few more. Uh, microfibers. So microfibers are teeny, teeny, tiny versions of fibers. What are they? Fibers that are much thinner, much finer than regular fibers. They were invented in Japan in the 1980s. The first microfiber was polyester, mainly because polyester is so easy to manipulate. And again, it's a polymer, so the uh, molecules sit very close together. Um, not a lot of room air within each, you know, particle or around each particle. So you can shape it to whatever you'd like. And it was very easy to make them much finer, much smaller. Um, so pros and cons of these microfibers. The fiber that can be produced as a microfiber are acrylic, nylon, polyester, lyocell, and rayon. Only manufactured fibers can be made into microfibers. Essentially, what we are doing when we create a microfiber, we're taking, look at one of your own human hairs, we're taking what would normally be the diameter or the size of your human hair, and we're making it at least half the size smaller, so that much finer. You can make it up to a tenth of the size finer. So it can be made so, 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 so tiny, which is great because, you know, it causes... Um, possesses the same properties as the normal thickness, but improved. So it's going to be softer in hand, more drapeable, better wicking, better print quality, better this, better that, better that. But it also has some poor um, qualities to it. Um, one of the main things, so I'm going to start going to the unfavorable class. Um, microfibers are more costly. So one of the main things that is bad about it is that they're very expensive because it has to go through more processes um, in order to produce them small. It also requires, requires more weaving time or more knitting time, more dyeing, more, more ink to cover the dense surface. So you just need more so it becomes more expensive. Uh, microfibers are often blended, so you can blend them or you can use them alone. Um, the more microfiber in the fabric itself, the silkier it becomes. Um, but again, the more expensive it becomes. 
Um, when a smaller percentage is used, the fabric has a nicer hand and better drape. So like wool, if you mix a microfiber with wool, it will become softer, it will feel better, it won't be as itchy. Um, but you know, it's really not going to cut anything in price point. Usually we mix wool with something else so that it's cheaper. This is actually going to make it more expensive. So one of the downsides to microfibers is they become much more expensive. Another unfavorable property of microfibers is that they become a pollutant. So they're so small that the typical filter can't filter them out because they're so tiny. And then they become a pollution in the oceans and air pollution. Um, that is definitely a major downside to these microfibers. Um, so it says, you know, benefits outweigh the cost. Um, raincoat of microfiber versus a raincoat of normal fiber with the addition of a water repellent finish, which is cheaper. So, I mean, you know, you think of a raincoat made of microfibers, the surface is going to be super dense, very little room for water to absorb into it, so it's going to work really well. You don't have to add a water repellent finish to it if you don't want, then. So which one's cheaper? But, again, you know, which one's better for the environment, too? So these are all things you can try to think of. Um, as we go through this entire semester, um, I try not to harp on it too much, but the, the impact in the environment is not good at all, period, for textiles. Um, and something like microfibers then cause damage after production too. So something to think about. Um, nanotechnology, a lot, again, a lot of you, when you turned in your articles, turned in articles related to nanotechnology. This is the next generation of technology in regards to textiles and in particular textile finishes. Nanotechnology is the ability to, in, um, to, ability to individually enhance um, specific atoms. Um, so you actually take each individual atom and you apply something to them to change them in an in a enhancing way. Water and oil repellency, wrinkle resistance, moisture control, comfort and luxury treatments. These are all nanotechnology that are added to the finishing process. So it's a finished process that uses nanotechnology to embed um, something particular to the actual atom itself. So it's done on a molecular level. It's done to a teeny, 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 tiny surface. Um, the beauty of nanotechnology is the original hand and comfort are all preserved and you're simply getting the benefits of that oil repellency, that water repellency, the wrinkle resistance, so on and so forth. So the great thing about nanotech is that the you get all the characteristics of the fabric steel with the added benefit of whatever the finish is you're putting on top of it. Fiber innovation, again, related to the articles you turned in. Innovation and technology have played an important role in the growth of the manufactured fiber industry. If it wasn't for innovation and technology, we would not have manufactured fibers to begin with. Again, you can create a new fiber, a new trademark fiber, but it's hard to make a new generic fiber. But you can manipulate and you can continue to try to better those generic categories to create these new age fibers, these new age textiles. Um, crafted by high performance fibers, yarn, finishes, or a combination of all. Um, fiber innovation, you know, were designed to manage moisture, regulate heat, inhibit the growth of bacteria, aid in athletic performance, aid in muscle recovery, circulation, moisturize the skin, SPF for outdoor wear. There are a ton of different innovations that have been applied to textiles and the, um, I mean, really, the possibilities are endless. So this was, again, this was why um, having those articles was so great, because you have access to everybody in class, and so many of those articles were based on fiber innovation. Okay? So I know that Chapter 3 is a lengthy one. It is a long one. I did run through it very quickly. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to inbox me. Um, you will have a quiz and study guide questions for Chapter 3. Now next week you will have your first exam. So exam, uh, the first exam will cover chapters one, two, and three. Lots of information from chapter three will be in there. Um, next week when the exam opens, as will the study guide. So you'll be able to look at the key points um, and make sure to go through that and you know make sure that you are answering all the questions. Okay, happy studying.